Hello and welcome to this discussion on correlation and regression. Specifically, we'll be looking further at the idea of Pearson correlation and how that is related to simple linear regression. And by simple linear regression, what we mean is that we have one predictor variable. Okay, and that's going to come in handy when we talk later about multiple linear regression, which means that we have more than one um, predictor variable. But for now, we're going to just stick with one and keep it simple. So if we go back to our, um, our original uh, scheme of starting with a population, and then from that population, we take a sample, a um, simple random sample, and then for each person in that sample we take a measurement of some kind and what we're measuring often are either categorical or continuous variables um, but then based on those variables that we measure we can also create other kinds of variables and when we created our um, simple scatter plot between two variables x and y what we ended up with based on that data is we ended up with a regression line which was y equals um, intercept plus slope times x. Um, the, this slope variable is something that we can come up with based on what we measure and so specifically um, we call that variable b um, or uh, beta in Greek, ver Greek alphabet and so B stands for slope. Um, the other thing that we can measure is R, or the, um, the correlation between those two variables, X and Y. And so, C-O-R-R, -R, so that's correlation. So we can measure a couple of different things based on the variables that we actually measure. And then as we go back, to be able to infer something about the population, then what we're inferring is the Greek letter beta or the Greek letter rho, um, which are the slope and correlation in, within the population. And so that's really what we're after here is we start with a bigger population that we would like to generalize to and then we take a sample of that and based on the measurements of our x and y then we can we can create slopes and correlation measurements um, calculations for that. Now in order to do that um, let's go ahead and think about our the data that we actually have. And in order to calculate the, the slope, um, the relationship between two variables, um, x and y, as we generally think about it in a um, scatter plot or, or a correlation, we need to have two continuous variables. And so what I've done here is I've listed scale and scale. So let's say we're interested in the relationship between height and weight. Remember the, the golden rule of data entry is that each row needs to represent an individual person. So here would be the height, let's say 53 inches and 120 pounds of a single person. The next row would represent the next person in our data set. So what we end up having in our spreadsheet is two scale variables, um, height and weight. And um, we, most of the time, we would have far more variables than eight, so this just means continued. The descriptive statistics for these two variables, then, are dependent on the fact that they are scale. And so typically for a scale variable, we make a histogram, we calculate the mean and the standard deviation. Actually, this should be, sorry. This should be x bar and sd. And so that's for, for each of the two variables. But then we also do another interesting thing. Remember, a histogram is the picture that we're making. Um, and we've kind of referred to this before. And that is that we make a scatter plot. And this is a scatter plot um, between those two variables. And so we make a scatter plot. And that helps us to see the relationship between them.
just by looking at the histogram itself and the mean and standard deviation for each variable, we may not notice that um, there is an unusual combination. It may be normal um, given um, one variable or the other one, but it stands out in that particular scatter. So that's um, what we're looking at for descriptive statistics is a histogram of each variable with the mean and standard deviation plus for our specific idea of doing a correlation or a simple linear regression we would want the scatter plot to support that analysis as well. So let's think about what we do in terms of um, hypothesis testing and estimation. Um, first of all, remember that for the hypothesis, we list our null hypothesis and our alternate hypothesis. The null hypothesis usually mean there's nothing going on, there's no relationship here, there's nothing interesting to see, one variable is not a good predictor of the other variable, things like that. So no, nothing, not. Um, not noticeable, that kind of thing. The alternate hypothesis then, as a reminder, is usually the thing that we're interested in researching. We want to know to what extent does height predict a person's weight. And um, based on a lot of data sets, we know that those two things are related. The taller somebody is, the more likely they are to weigh more. Um, the shorter they are, the more likely they are to weigh less. And we all know that within each height, there is a range of weights. And so that's what gives our scatter plot its, um, its football shape. So if we think about that, the null and alternate hypothesis then, we can write that in terms of correlation we can write that in terms of slope and we can also write that null hypothesis in terms of linearity. And so let me show what you what each of those looks like. Um, when we're looking at the null hypothesis for correlation, what we generally say is that rho is equal to zero. For slope, we would say that the beta coefficient for x is equal to zero. In other words, there's nothing going on. Um, for linearity, we usually have to describe that in word format. And so we say um, there is no linear relationship between, um, and then we list x and y, whatever those variables are. There's no linear relationship between height and weight. For the relationship between height and weight, the slope is equal to zero. For the relationship between height and weight, the correlation is equal to zero. And so those are three equivalent ways of listing the null hypothesis. And very often students will ask me, well, what if I reject the null hypothesis for correlation, but I fail to reject the null hypothesis for slope? And what I can tell you in this specific case is that will never, ever happen. And, and there are a few things in life that are absolute, but this one is. And the reason for that is because the math behind the correlation coefficient is exactly the same as the math behind the slope. We're just looking at two different aspects of the same statistical analysis. Same thing for linearity. Um, the p-value for all three of those evaluations will be exactly identical. So um, regardless of the way we're approaching that specific problem, um, we will always come up with the same um, conclusion when we get to the end of the analysis. Um, it's worth noting then that the alternate hypothesis is that rho is not equal to zero, it must be something else, or that the slope is not equal to zero, or there is a linear rate relationship between x and y. So however it is that, that we're um, defining those x and y, there is a linear relationship between height and weight. And that is actually the case with height and weight. So here I want to take a little bit of a detour and I want to, I want to redraw our, um, our uh, scatter plot so that we have a kind of like one right here on the page that we can work with. And I'm going to put a few dots on there just so that, and we'll pretend that this is our relationship between height and weight. Um, and I'll draw a line that hopefully is as close to through the middle of the cloud as I possibly can. And we'll say this is um, height, which is our 
x variable or our independent variable and then here on the y-axis this would be weight or our dependent and it's it's worth getting used to using the that terminology dependent and independent in other words what you're saying is um, weight a person's weight is dependent on how tall they are and so you can you can always turn that um, those two variables into a sentence like that that makes it a little easier to understand and just by convention we put the dependent variable or y here on the y-axis on the vertical axis and we put the x variable or the independent variable along the horizontal axis so that's just kind of a, a standard convention um, as we learned before um, this line can be described by uh, an equation that goes y equals intercept plus slope times x. And um, previously in high school, you probably saw the equation y equals mx plus b. Um, this equation that we're going to use right here just changes things around and when we get to multiple regression it will make more sense why they do that but basically the B is the um, intercept the M is the slope and the X is the X and Y is the Y so really it includes the same components but it's just rearranged a little bit so um, this is the same equation you've been learning all along if you took geometry back in high school hopefully that will bring back some really good memories for you so um, another way of writing this then instead of saying y equals intercept plus slope times x is a lot of times and this is probably the equation that you'll see more often is that if you have y equals b sub 0 plus b sub 1 times x sub 1 and so this is the equation that you're more likely to see and what that means is that this b sub 0 is our y-intercept and the b sub 1 is the slope that goes along with our variable x1 and I'll label that x1 here on our axis now um, the reason that we label it x1 is that later with multiple regression we're going to have more than one predictor variable and so we're going to expand that very equation but for now we're just going to stick with the equation that only has one and so remember that y is our dependent x is our independent and if I were to tell you what the y-intercept and the slope were and then give you a specific value for x you could calculate y the expected y at that particular level in other words if I um, if we have this line that describes this this um, an equation that describes this line if I know x then I can go up here and I can trace that across and I can tell you what the expected y is for that particular um, uh, location of x and I could do that um, anywhere here along the x-axis and along the y-axis so given any specific um, variable or value for x then that would help me know what y should be at that level or approximately now remember how um, uh, on this graph we actually have a little bit of spread out that the amount that it's spread out um, represents the residuals or how far away each of those dots is from the regression line that we ended up with the least squares line in other words the line that is cl the closest collectively to the entire um, field the entire that cloud um, of, of data points and so what we do is we call that um, we can we can describe that with the correlation coefficient and we label that correlation or Pearson correlation coefficient R and that is equal to some number for for that particular analysis remember that correlation coefficient is anywhere between negative 1 and positive 1 so I'm gonna go ahead and draw a little line here because we're we're going to use this Let's see where's the middle so I'm gonna say that's a correlation coefficient of 0 
here's a correlation coefficient of plus 1, and here's a correlation coefficient of minus 1. And remember, the sign of the correlation coefficient simply tells us which direction the cloud is going. If we have a correlation coefficient of minus 1, then that means that my angle, the angle of that line, is a negative line, in other words, down and to the right. If my correlation coefficient is here on the positive side, then that is up and to the right. And so there's a, a positive direction to that. Where r equals 0, that means there is no correlation. And then there are some kind of general rules of thumb. For a correlation that's between positive 0 0.1 and positive 0 0.3, that is considered to be a small or a weak um, correlation between those two variables. That is exactly equivalent to negative 0 0.1 and negative 0 0.3. That segment, let me get a different color, this amount of correlation is the same because it's just the magnitude that it is away from this middle point or zero. And so it can be in the positive or the negative direction and it has the same strength. So this is also considered a small or a weak correlation. Anything, according to your textbook, they use um, anything between about 0.3 to 0.7. Um, so here's a negative 0 0.7. This segment right here is a moderate or a medium association. So, so that's um, kind of like in the middle. A lot of the associations that we see in public health are small or weak. Um, there are some strong ones that we have really already identified anywhere here between plus 0.7 and plus 1 or negative 0.7 and negative 1. And this is considered a strong or a large association. You'll also hear the, the word effect size when you relate to this this correlation coefficient r so strong or large a large effect size um, so those are just some synonyms for that um, if you if you think about that kind of range if you if you if you're somewhere here in the middle and that's probably not representing something that's genuinely there or that maybe is um, terribly important so that's the kind of thing that we like to think about um, in terms of the correlation coefficient. So that can be anywhere between negative 1 and positive 1. Um, there's another thing, so these, this all had to do with r. There's another variable that has to do with r, and that is r squared. And that is called the coefficient of determination. Um, of determination. And that coefficient of determination, literally you just take r and you square it. It's not complicated. It's not supposed to be anything that is um, magical or hard. So if you were to take a number, um, say right here in the middle, uh, 0.5, if you had r is equal to 0 0.5 and you square that, then r squared would be equal to 0 0.25. So hopefully you can see that um, that co coefficient of determination is simply just a, a basic calculation. If, you, if your r was equal to 1 and you squared that, then your r squared would also be equal to 1. So um, the coefficient of determination also varies, um, but instead of varying between negative 1 and positive 1, if you square negative 1, that gives you a positive 1. So the coefficient of determination varies between 0 and 1 um, because it's a squared property. Um, let me draw something for you that I think will probably be helpful in terms of this r and r squared. For r, we're really looking to see what this effect size is, and this is kind of like a, a 
single dimension along and it's just literally it's along this axis right here anywhere between negative one and positive one if we were to take that same kind of an axis and we were to go um, from like I said it goes from zero to one um, and we were to square that and so here I am making something that's that's a field and we were to say okay um, here we have an R that is 0.5 let me draw it in a color, an R that is 0.5 for this particular variable. In other words, um, I should probably draw it down here at the bottom. Um, if I square that 0.5, then what I end up with is that this other variable, whatever, like let's say this is X and this is Y, um, that's not a very good Y, these two overlap for 0.25 of the area of y. In other words, um, x is predicts y by 25 percent. And so the, the definition of this coefficient of determination is the proportion of variability in y that is explained by or that is predicted by this x variable. And this is a very important concept because somebody will ask you um, to look at some data and they'll say, well what how much of y is predicted by x? How much of y is explained by x? So this is the proportion of variability in y that is explained or predicted by x. I keep making these y's that don't look like a y. Sorry about that. Okay, so the proportion of variability in y that is explained by x. And so as the r goes up, so does the coefficient of de determination. And, and we can see that um, simply by understanding how the math in that works. Um, but also um, visually, hopefully, in this, in this diagram here. Okay, so I've covered a lot of things there. The other thing that I want to point out with this simple scatter plot here is that if we were to take a line that had a specific intercept, and let's say that we have this intercept here, and we had we changed the slope of that, basically what that does is it um, takes it through the same uh, axis point, but it shifts that into a different slope. And so we could have um, a very similar line with the same intercept. And so the intercept is kind of like this hinge point. We could have another line that's this way. Um, and so that y-intercept just tells us the location um, when x equals zero, zero what, is, what is the value of y. The other thing that can happen to this um, to this regression line is it can be shifted in one direction or another. In other words, um, the slope could stay the same, but we could just shift it up by like two points. So instead of hinging down here, we would hinge farther up, but then the slope of that could actually stay the same. So if we keep the slope constant but change the intercept, then it just shifts the whole entire line upwards. And so that's th those are two kinds of things to think about when we start looking at the at the output of the data that these intercept and slope variables are really estimates and so in thinking about kind of like the way that that can change um, just being able to visualize that okay so that was a quick review of the things that we learned from the scatter plot um, and a little bit of extra information in terms of this whole idea of now we're here, we're going to do a hypothesis test. There's no linear relationship between height and weight, or for the relationship between height and weight, the slope is equal to zero, or that the correlation is equal to zero. The test that we're going to run is generally called a simple linear regression. Now, some people might call it a Pearson correlation, and I would argue that those two things are really exactly the same. Pearson correlation. You can call it either either or. Um, it really is we're testing the relationship between two continuous variables. And so as soon as we're doing that, then we are doing a simple linear regression.
there are three primary assumptions that you need to know about for simple linear regression. That is normality, which we've seen before. Um, also, equal variances, which has a special name with simple linear regression. We call it homoskedasticity. So let me write that here. But that really is just the same as the equal variance that we've thought about so far. And then we also have a new one, which is the assumption of linearity. Now let me tell you a little bit quickly how those assumptions are um, evaluated. For normality, what we're interested in is whether the residuals are normally distributed. So we take all of these residuals, remember the residuals are um, the distance between each of our points um, and the regression line, and what we do is we, is we plot them on a histogram and we say, hmm, I wonder if those are normally distributed. So we really we're testing normality very much the way we were before. For both homoskedasticity and linearity, however, we do something called a residual plot. And essentially, that is taking all of those residuals, and so here's our residuals, and we're plotting them uh, across uh, this other expected value. And so here they are. And this is an example of a residual plot where both linearity and homoskedasticity are met. The thing that I want to point out is that as we go across um, the graph, that the width here, um, these, the variability or the variance, is the same all the way across. And so we don't have it being narrower or wider. You also notice that I can draw a straight line, or um, and that's the, the assumption of linearity. I can draw a straight line through those residuals. Um, let me draw quickly an example of a, a residual plot where equal variances or homoskedasticity is not met. And so what that would look like is more like this, where we kind of have this um, curved shape. To the, to the residuals. And you can see in this case, probably a better line for that um, would not be um, a straight line. It would be a, a curved line. In this plot, however, we still do have equal variances. If I was to kind of imagine here, at least the way I tried to draw it, um, that these still are spread out about the same um, as you go along the plot from left to right. An example where equal variances is not met would look more like this. And so if you were to have this um, residual plot and those residuals are narrow on one end but they get wider and wider and wider as you go across the plot. And so what you'll see here is kind of more of a fan shape. In other words, they're distributed narrowly here and they get wider as you go across. Now as, as you do more analyses, um, you'll start to um, be able to pick up on this. Um, here, though, you see that this still does look like a straight line fits through the middle of it as opposed to this one over here. So those are the three assumptions that go along with simple linear regression. The test statistic that we get is an F statistic. You saw that before with one-way ANOVA. And again, we calculate the F statistic and then compare it um, and create a p-value that goes along with that F statistic depending on the um, number of degrees of freedom. Our critical value typically, again, is 0.05. If it's less than 0.05, then we would reject this null up here. Um, for any given analysis, then, you would have a calculated p-value. And if it's less than 0.05, then you would reject the null. And generally, if it's greater than 0.05, you fail to reject the null. And you say, yep, looks like that could be possible. Um, in terms of the 95% confidence interval, generally you get a 95% confidence interval for the slope um, when that output is created. And so that's kind of our equivalent to estimation, as we were kind of looking at it before. And then the significance or the decision, um, again, we kind of reviewed quickly. Um, you would reject the null if it was less than 0.05 and fail to reject the null if it's greater than 0.05. Literally what you're saying then, um, in kind of this plain language, it is um, if you were to, to reject the null, it is unlikely for a sample with a 
let's say slope, sample slope B of whatever number you came up with, to have been randomly drawn from a population with a population slope equal to zero. So it would be it would be pretty unlikely. Here's my population and I randomly draw this sample. What are the chances that I come up with a sample that does have a significant slope? The other way that you could say that in terms of correlation is that it would be unlikely for me to have drawn a sample with a correlation equal to some significant number um, to have been randomly drawn from a population that really does not have um, any correlation between those two variables. Um, in terms of the way we generally uh, portray that information in a in an article is in table format. So now suddenly we're moving away from written out sentences as a standard way and that table would include both the intercept and the variable, whatever um, our x variable is, and the, beta, the two beta coefficients that go with those as well as a p-value or a significance level. So that um, kind of summarizes what my analysis would look like. I'd like to end with a very short discussion about statistical significance, which is something that we get here with our p-value and our 95% confidence interval versus clinical importance. So statistical significance versus clinical importance. And this relates a lot of times to the sample size, so it's a, this is a good place to have that conversation. A lot of times if I have a really, really, really large sample size, then I can achieve statistical significance for whatever it is that I'm analyzing. So let's say that I want to evaluate whether um, there's a, um, a decrease in um, blood pressure because of some intervention and I have a sample of um, like 200,000 people that I had this intervention and if I was to see a decrease in blood pressure by 0 0.01 millimeters of mercury I could with this huge sample size I could show statistical significance but is that change in blood pressure really going to to have an impact clinically on my population. This is where this whole discussion of statistical significance versus clinical importance, this is where a person really needs to understand the biology behind what it is that we're analyzing and the, the whole um, uh, the, the rationale for what it is that, that we're trying to get to. Um, because something can be statistically significant, but it can really not have the level of clinical importance that we are looking for. The flip side is also true, where a lot of times we'll do something called a pilot study. And so we'll have a very small sample size, sometimes only um, a handful, less than a dozen. And our statistical significance does not show anything that is you know, p-value less than 0.05. However, the magnitude of the change that we see between the actual numbers before and after might reveal something that is clinically important. And so what that means is then we would take that pilot study and we would want to do something of a larger study to be able to have the power to be able to show that relationship is really there. So that's really um, an important piece of any time we are doing a, a statistical analysis that we keep in mind that we want to have the right size so that we can show statistical significance for the kind of relationship that is clinically important. Not too large of a data set and not too small. So that concludes our discussion on correlation and regression.